Hello, everyone, and um, welcome to Medic Alert's Live Healthy Hour. Really glad that you joined us today um, for our new um, Healthy Hour. And today we have a couple of guests with us from the Convalescent Plasma Clinical Trials, and we'll be talking about new clinical trials in COVID-19. Our host today, um, I'm Melody Howard. I'm the Community Alliances Director at Medic Alert Foundation, and joining me as co-host is Julie Hilton, our Vice President of Communications. Welcome, Hello, Julie. everyone. Great. So today's agenda, we'll, I'll talk a little bit about Medic Alert. Um, you'll meet our speakers, and they'll be talking about the clinical trials overview. Then we'll spend the bulk of our time on Q&A with Dr. Shom and Sullivan and we'll share some resources for you. So a little bit about Medic Alert. If you're not aware about our organization, we're the original medical ID, um, and we were founded in 1956 by a doctor in Turlock, California. And this doctor had an idea to protect his daughter, and now that's become the globally recognized symbol for medical emergencies. So I'm all very familiar with the Medic Alert symbol. What sets Medical Alert apart? Why are, how are we different? Um, Medical Alert stores an emergency health pro profile on all of our members. And we have a 24 seven emergency response service that provides that health record in the event that something happens to our members and they're unable to speak for themselves. We're the only nonprofit organization in the medical ID space. Um, our, we're a mission-driven organization, and our mission has been to protect and save lives by sharing vital information in our members' moments of need. And we're very proud of um, to be part of that mission and continuing that legacy. Um, how the Medical Alert service works, it starts with a custom engraved Medical Alert ID that's engraved with your most vital medical information. Emergency responders call our 24-7 emergency response team who provides information on your health record, which you can maintain online, um, keeping medical conditions, additional medical conditions, medications, allergies. It contains a lot of information that's really important to know in case of emergency. And we spend a number of years training first responders to look for the Medic Alert ID and to call Medic Alert so that they can be empowered with the most vital up-to-date information so that they can treat you appropriately in a case of emergency. Great. So today, um, we're very um, honored to have our guest speakers, Dr. Shmuel Shom and Dr. David Sullivan. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about them. Dr. Shom is an associate professor of medicine at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. He has over 20 years of experience in management of highly, Im highly immunocompromised patients, serves as a reviewer and expert consultant to multiple journals, professional societies and government agencies and is a member of professional guideline committees for several national and international organizations. These include the Infectious Diseases Society of America Guidelines for COVID-19. He has extensive experience in supervising and conducting antimicrobial clinical trials as principal investigator and in overseeing safety aspects of such trials through work as an independent safety monitor and as a member of the data safety monitoring boards for various studies, including those involving COVID-19. He's principal and co-principal, um, excuse me, principal and co-investigator on six interventional COVID-19 trials and serves as a consultant and safety board member for five other COVID-19 trials. The plasma research team at Johns Hopkins, of which he is a key member, was recently awarded approximately 35 million in federal funding to study convalescent plasma for COVID prevention and early treatment. Um, joining him, Dr. Sullivan. Um, Dr. David Sullivan has 27 years of exper research experience on malaria and erythrocyte, and his area of expertise focuses on heme, homo. I'm not really sure how to say that. <laughs> Sorry. Hemozoan. <laughs> Thank Hema, you. Hemozoan. <laughs> and metal metabolism in the malaria infected erythrocyte related to diagnostics and drug action. His research work has also involved malaria clinical field studies in Bangladesh and Africa. 
SARS-CoV-2 has transformed our society and science. Scientists from diverse disciplines have focused on this virus. Dr. Sullivan has pivoted from a mostly malaria bench researcher with limited observational human trials in Africa and Bangladesh to a COVID-19 clinical trialist. At present, there is no proven outpatient therapy for COVID-19. Therapy is only available at the hospital. Dr. Sullivan is national PI on the early treatment of outpatient COVID-19, which aimed to prevent hospitalization and death with a single transfusion of high SARS-CoV-2 antibody teeter convalescent plasma. The trial plans to recruit about 1,000 patients in three months at more than 25 study sites throughout the country. Welcome, gentlemen. Um, I'll turn it over to you now um, to talk a little bit about these COVID-19 antibody trials. Sure, I'll get started. Um, so I'm uh, Dr. Sullivan, thanks for having me and thanks for letting us share what we consider vital information uh, about the COVID epidemic. Um, I'm just going to explain the basic bits, Dr. Schoen will, and then he'll uh, talk about plasma in general. So we're focused on outpatient treatment before you get to the hospital. Um, and we know antibodies work better the earlier that they're given. So this trial is focused on whether the COVID convalescent plasma can be effective at preventing hospitalizations and deaths uh, when given in the first week of illness rather than the second or the third week. Um, so to be eligible, you just have to be over age 18 and have a positive diagnostic test with onset of symptoms um, before transfusion within eight or nine days. Uh, Dr. Schoen. Uh, thanks. So uh, I'll pick it up and I'll give a little bit of the background in that uh, there's two forms of immunization. One is called active immunization, where a vaccine product is given and then the body makes antibodies. And the other one is called passive immunization, where you take antibodies that have already been formed uh, by, uh, in this particular situation, by people that have survived the infection, and then you give that to them as a protection, either just before they become infected as a preventative or after they become infective to halt the disease uh, progress in its track. We do this all the time. There's a, a, a treatment for uh, if somebody is bitten by a rabid dog or a dog that's suspected to be rabid, we give uh, hyperimmune globulin uh, against uh, rabies. That's antibodies that were formed by uh, people that had a good response to the vaccine. And then we give also the vaccine so that they can start making their own antibody, but at least they're protected until that period of time. Well, we don't have a vaccine yet, hopefully very soon, but not yet. Uh, and uh, uh, antibodies can potentially be something that can uh, give you protection, whether you've been exposed or have an early infection uh, until uh, the, um, uh, the, the body can start making its own antibodies if there is a vaccine. And if not, then at least it can give you protection, get you over the hump. Um, so uh, the reason that we're doing this trial is to find out if it really works or not. Uh, we suspect that it works based on, uh, on, on history, based on how the biology of the virus and antibodies work, but we don't really know for a fact that it does, which is why we're doing a study, the highest level of evidence, a randomized control blinded trial using antibody rich plasma. Um, and uh, compared that to plasma that does, does not have antibody against coronavirus, and then seeing if we can prevent the infection from happening, or if it's already started, if we can stop it in its track. Uh, there's a lot to suggest that this is going to be uh, effective, but of course we won't know until we do the trial. Why do we think it's going to be effective? Is that um, uh, there's a large study that has been completed in inpatients, um, and it, it was not a randomized control trial. It was an observational trial where everybody in the study got plasma. But what was noted was that people that got the high octane stuff, stuff with a lot of antibody, and the people that got it early in the course of infection within three days of being diagnosed had a better outcome than people that got sort of a low antibody product and that got it late. Now, in our studies, 
everybody that's going to get plasma is either going to get high antibody plasma or no antibody plasma. So we're going to test out to see whether high antibody plasma works as we think it would. And everybody's going to get it early because they're going to still be outpatients or in the case of the post-exposure prophylaxis study, they're going to get it even before they have uh, infections. So uh, before I hand it back to Dr. Sullivan to talk about his study uh, in more uh, uh, detail, I'll say that the post-exposure prophylaxis, that's the earliest study that, uh, um, th that is being done with plasma, and that takes people that have been exposed. So if it's somebody that is a teacher and there's a student in the classroom that she's been exposed to and that student is positive, that teacher could be potentially enrolled in the study to see if we can prevent her or him from getting an infection. If there's somebody who is uh, a parent and their child comes home and the child is infected, um, then that parent could get uh, uh, protection uh, potentially uh, from uh, the, the study. And just this week, one of uh, my long-term patients who is a transplant recipient called me and said, oh boy, my son's got uh, uh, coronavirus, what do I do? And in addition to all the usual things that we say, the social distancing, the hand hygiene, the mask, I also said, well, we also have a clinical trial that you can be, you and your wife can be a part of where we're going to test to see whether we can prevent you from getting an infection by, instead of having vaccinated you, would have been nice to do that a few months ago if we had a vaccine and anyway, as a liver transplant recipient, maybe he wasn't going to respond all that well because he's immunosuppressed, but we don't have that. Let's try this out. And we're hoping that if we get the data and it shows that it's uh, effective, then uh, that is information we can give to patients, to their families, to their doctors, to the FDA, to make a decision as to whether for prevention, plasma can work. I'll hand it over to Dr. Sullivan and uh, uh, probably be picking up again soon. Thanks. Um, just like to continue the uh, student teacher analogy. I mean, we think this outpatient deployment of convalescent plasma will help society return to functioning, mainly because if teachers knew they could teach and if they had symptoms, uh, they could get diagnosed and then get a one time treatment and avoid the hospital, then I think that would open up society. The Department of Defense is funding us because for the same principle, um, it helps military readiness to not uh, take troops offline because someone in their group uh, got the virus. One, to evacuate them, you want good therapy. The military's very efficient at giving plasma. Uh, that's what they've been giving for 100 years for military situations. But we've all also been giving convalescent plasma uh, against an infectious disease also for 100 years. So we have more than a 100 year history of it working, but mainly in very sick hospitalized populations. What's unique with the scope of this epidemic is it's necessitated us proving uh, for one of the first times that it really works in the outpatient space. We know serum works well against preventing measles uh, that's been shown 70, 80 years ago, but we're trying to show it for this specific virus. Um, I'll stop there. And I mean, I think uh, Terry had a question for us. We can proceed with that. Great. So we'll jump right into um, the Q&A sec section of our presentation today. Um, we'll spend the bulk of our time here. We had a lot of great questions. We'll try to hit as many as those as we possibly can. Um, so what is convalescent plasma and what's the history behind it? So I'll, I'll take this one uh, and then uh, uh, Dr. Sullivan will take the next one. So convalescent, so plasma is the clear yellowish liquid that's in uh, blood. So about 55% of blood is not the red stuff, but it's actually a yellowish stuff. And in plasma, there are antibodies. And uh, those antibodies uh, in a person that has recovered from infection could be antibodies against coronavirus. So the concept of using plasma, as Dr. Sullivan mentioned, has been used for uh, over 100 years. As I mentioned, uh, you can concentrate it uh, and 
and create hyper immune globulin, which is sort of a concentrated form of it. Uh, and, and that's been used for rabies. It's also being used for uh, other uh, uh, situations like hepatitis B and, uh, and other infections. We don't have that concentrated material yet, but we do have plasma today. And that's why we're testing it. And the way that it works is we think that the antibody in the plasma against the virus, so a person gets the infection, survives the infection. One of the ways that they survive the infection is by making antibodies that uh, stick to the virus and kill it. Um, and then we can take that plasma that has the antibody in the survivor and give it to a person who then has the infection or exposed to it. And those antibodies from the person that has survived are transferred into the person who's now at risk or has an infection. And then that can work as an antiviral inside the recipient. So our next question we had um, submitted by Michelle, Rebecca, and Susan, is convalescent plasma currently being used to treat people with COVID? And if so, who is eligible to receive it? Convalescent plasma has been used since the beginning of the epidemic. It was first used in the United States in, uh, in, in Dallas. It's been used in China um, and uh, mainly in hospital settings. So it's been in over 100,000 people. It's been shown to be safe. It does not make the infection worse. Um, and it does improve death and outcome when it's used in the hospital. Um, convalescent plasma is a rather egalitarian therapy um, in that it can be made widely available um, and um, in developing countries and also in um, uh, distant places in the United States, uh, the plasma can be shipped and it's relatively low cost. And it does, um, I mean, I think that, uh, yeah, it is widely available. I would like to contrast um, convalescent plasma and monoclonal antibodies. Um, so there's sort of the scale of this immediate immunity providing antibodies. Convalescent plasma has a mixture of different immunoglobulins and other factors that fight infections. Um, and then if you pull out just the antibody fraction, then we call it hyperimmune globulin or immune globulins. And that leaves behind many of the other bits in, um, in uh, plasma itself. Uh, and then uh, many companies, Eli Lilly is one of them, where you can take uh, B cells from patients who are recovered and you can sequence that and then you can manufacture like a single monoclonal antibody, which Eli Lilly is trying. Regeneron has taken maybe more than 100 cells, each making monoclonal antibodies and has made a cocktail. Convalescent plasma has thousands of different antibodies, um, whereas the monoclonals are very specific and if they're a little bit off, they may not work as well. But they're all on that spectrum, uh, but there's more and more regulations as you move up through hyperimmune globulin and to the monoclonal antibodies. There's also an increase in cost and a decrease availability. So convalescent plasma is uh, people are eligible to receive it. If you, even if you receive blood products in the past, you're still eligible to, uh, to receive it. Probably about the only contraindication are those who are on anticoagulants. And there it's a risk benefit because in the end, the small amount of plasma that you get probably won't uh, predispose predispose you greatly to a clot, but it's a relative contraindication um, and um, such that, um, yeah, if you're on anticoagulation, that's about the only, uh, I guess, group that I would say would not be eligible to receive convalescent plasma. Otherwise, it's safe during pregnancy. We have not excluded pregnant women in our studies. Uh, it's uh, my first patient was someone who uh, had CLL, had gotten chemotherapy, and 
lost his antibody productions, common variable immunodeficiency. So he was dependent upon immunoglobulins once a week. He got the virus and he was, um, was also eligible for the study and got the convalescent plasma. Uh, so, but it's not in the outpatient space now, it's just in hospitalized patients. And we're trying to show efficacy in the outpatient space. Thank you. So currently it's only authorized for use in a hospitalization? Correct. Uh, that if you, you can't, you can't give, can't give, you, you can't give convalescent plasma to someone before they get to the hospital when they're in outpatients unless you enter one of these clinical trials. So entering the trials enables you to have a 50% chance in this randomized double-blinded trial of getting convalescent plasma with uh, antibodies in it. And they, um, all of the convalescent plasma contains various amounts of neutralizing antibodies. And in general, the neutralizing, neutralizing antibodies uh, correlate with the overall antibody measurement against the virus. Uh, but not all antibodies against the virus work to neutralize it. Um, and, but in some people with low amounts of general antibodies to the virus have high neutralization and vice versa, but there's generally a decent correlation on that. Thanks. Our next question from Patricia, why do you believe convalescent plasma could be a good early treatment to avoid hospitalizations or to prevent spread of COVID-19? Thanks. I'll Go ahead, Shmuel. Oh, oh. Um, I'll take the hospitalizations and I'll turn the spread over to you. Um, so um, it's about like uh, having a single cup of water and putting it on a couple of matches that are lit, that it's easy to douse those lit matches. Uh, but if you wait till the fire is raging a little bit, then that cup of water doesn't go very far. So when there's lots of virus, when the immune system has responded and you're in the hospital, we know the antibodies work, but not just as well. So we think the earlier that it's given, uh, that we can stop all the virus in the tracks and reverse the course of disease. And there is evidence uh, in there was an Argentine hemorrhagic fever where dose, dose mattered uh, and the earlier it was given. And so the bulk of our 100 years of using plasma or any antibody uh, therapy in that mind uh, points to earlier in the disease process and the higher titer that you give, uh, usually the better outcome. But we don't know a threshold. It could be you just have to reach a threshold and you have a diminishing return after you reach certain titers for this early course. Um, so I'll let Shmuel talk about spread of COVID-19. Um, so just add, adding to the, to the point, so what we have now is we have results from a study that involved tens of thousands of people uh, that was conducted by the FDA in Mayo. And the most important thing that uh, uh, was the result of that study in terms of this question is that if you got it early, and if you got it with enough antibody in it, if you got the high octane stuff and you got it early, you did better than if you got it late and with low antibody titer. And based on that, and based on everything that Dr. Sullivan mentioned, and based on our understanding of the biology of the virus, I think we can anticipate that early is better than late, and how much earlier can you be than just before you develop the infection? So our next question from Sarah Lee, I've heard COVID-19 antibodies don't stay in the blood for a long period of time. So is convalescent plasma still viable for prevention? Um, so the, the, uh, the answer is uh, yes, and, but it depends. So if we give convalescent plasma just after somebody's had an exposure, then we think, and this is why we're doing the study to, to find out for sure, that it will be protective because they'll get a big slug of antibodies during that time of high risk. Now, that antibody level in the blood will start to wear out over time 
as the person as opposed to somebody who's had the infection or somebody who has uh, gotten the vaccine. They're not making new antibodies all the time, but it is wearing out. However, it is possible that they are making antibodies because it's possible that getting that uh, uh, plasma uh, prevented them from getting a rip-roaring infection, but maybe a low enough level infection that they are making antibody, but, uh, but not enough for them to really get sick. It's also possible that they aren't gonna get infected at all and therefore not make antibodies. One of the things that we're doing with this study is measuring how long those antibodies stay in the body. Are they gonna stay in the body for 30 days, 60 days, 90 days? Does it depend on how much uh, antibody was in the plasma that they received? Does it make a difference based on the person's uh, age, gender, race? We're gonna look at all those things and every single person that's in this study, we're gonna to hope to follow them for 90 days to see what happens to their antibody and to be able to then use that information to be able to answer uh, Sarah Lee's question for as many patients as possible. Right, because there is no definitive answer right now as well, I understand, on how yeah. long the antibodies stay in uh, in the system? Uh, yeah, but we do know that antibodies have a half-life of about three weeks, i.e. that, and this is data giving monoclonals or polyclonals in humans, that if you give a certain titer, the half-life is three weeks. So to get down 90% of the original level, that that's two months. So it depends on, back to Sarah Lee's uh, uh, and our question is how long is long? So I think for preventing a short-term exposure for 14 days, then the half-lives of these are plenty long enough to prevent uh, a short-term exposure just for two weeks when you have antibodies possibly lasting at least a month, but maybe two months. Um, and even if you get a, a high octane titer, uh, rangers or seals going on a mission, uh, they might be protected for a full two months. Um, and but that's what we have to uh, have to work on. So I think yeah, the half lives are um, on the order of three weeks. So that means um, ninety percent of it's gone in nine weeks time. Um, and but when you make it naturally, your cells are still pumping it out eventually your cells are gonna stop pumping it out and then those antibodies that you make tighter back down to where it's sort of baseline. We don't sustain antibodies to pneumococcal pneumonia for years and years, but if we encounter it again, we have a rapid response memory uh, that then is quickly able to uh, engage in the virus again. Thanks. So our next question from Lewis, have other trials been conducted for convalescent plasma? What was learned and how are your trials different? Um, so I can start that because I've been involved in trials for convalescent plasma before. And uh, I was involved in a phase two and a phase three trial looking at plasma for influenza. And uh, what we learned from the phase two trial was that there might be something that can be effective against influenza. And we also learned that it is possible to use plasma as a, uh, as a therapeutic in the modern age because uh, it had been used before. And a lot of the lessons that we learned in that phase two trial, we've applied to what we're doing now. The phase three trial, was a randomized double-blind control study, very similar to this one. And that one did not show plasma to be effective against influenza. And if, you, if, if I learned anything from, from reading about Vince Lombardi is when you get knocked down, you gotta get back up again and try to learn why you got knocked down. And we think that the reason that that trial did not work in terms of, well, it worked because we learned something, but it didn't work in terms of showing us that plasma is effective is because plasma was started too late. Many of the patients were already in the ICU. Many of the patients were quite sick. And it's possible that the antibody level in, that, uh, uh, in, in the plasma that we're, we were using was too low. So from those trials, uh, we learned about what we're doing uh, now. And therefore, we think that there's a chance that we'll be effective. I also mentioned, I already mentioned the large 
tens of thousands of patients trial that has been done by the FDA and Mayo and the lessons we've learned from there. And there are a couple of other trials that are ongoing that uh, probably Dr. Sullivan is going to talk about uh, that are a little bit similar to what he's doing, but still different. Right. On, on the specific um, SARS-CoV-2 convalescent plasma space, uh, you have the spectrum right now of Dr. Shoham's study on infection prevention, where there might be no virus or there might just be an exposure and we're wiping that out. I'm a little bit further along when the virus is established, there's symptoms, but it's in the first week. And then there's a so-called C3PO study when people are sick enough to go to the emergency room, but not sick enough to go to the hospital. And there's um, a, um, a randomized trial there in the emergency room. And then there's, um, right now, there's access in the hospital to convalescent plasma um, and some randomized clinical trials uh, are still being conducted to look at efficacy. Uh, the expanded access program was primarily designed to look at safety and to, uh, they're trying to glean the efficacy uh, effects, which are all pointing in the direction, in a positive direction that it works, but it's much more difficult to glean the exact amount of a reduction in deaths. Uh, we can get some clues uh, earlier and higher the tighter, you have the number of deaths. Um, and so those are, but uh, so ours are different from many of the hospital use in that the 100,000 people did not get it as a randomized double-blinded study. So in some respects, um, we're trying to accomplish an efficacy result with a much smaller number, um, uh, 500 in the case of infection prevention and around 1,000 people with uh, early treatment. Uh, and we might need a less number of people in both trials if it's very effective at uh, reducing hospitalizations or uh, preventing an infection. So the biggest difference is we're in the outpatient space rather than in the inpatient. We would like to prove something that works outside the hospital. We don't want people to go to the hospital to get therapy, plain and simple. All right, I'm gonna hit some of the questions on the panel if that's okay. Uh, uh, because I, I know people, uh, I know myself, when I ask a question, I want the answer right away. So mm -hmm. I'm going to hit those. Uh, uh, one of the questions was by Audrey, who wanted to know whether the plasma can cause an exacerbation of autoimmune disease. We don't think so. And the reason we don't think so is because there is uh, plasma is being used all the time for many, many different indications. Uh, and this particular plasma, the only way that it's different than regular plasma that's used for all kinds of indications is that it has high antibody levels against this specific coronavirus. But otherwise, it's all the same plasma as what we use every day. And uh, it's been given to probably over 100,000 people in the US now for coronavirus. And in the studies looking at 5,000 of them, then 20,000 of them, then 35,000 of them, we've not seen autoimmune diseases flare up. That doesn't mean to say that for an individual, it can't happen and everybody has to be cognizant of their own body and their understanding of their body. But we think that uh, that, that is not going to be an issue. Whether a vaccine will do this, I don't know enough about the vaccine and the side effects that are seen with the vaccines. I think when the vaccines come out, we'll have much more information about their safety. There was a question about whether the donors are screened for HIV and plasma donors are screened for exactly the same thing as every blood donor is in this country in terms of uh, they're asked questions about their behavior. That's the first line of screening. And then the blood itself is screened with uh, very sophisticated tests that pick up uh, HIV and other infections. The blood supply is incredibly safe and this plasma is part of the blood supply. You know, a couple of questions that we had that didn't make it into the presentation were around um, is, uh, is it dependent on blood type? You know, when you have a blood transfusion, it has to be matched to type. Does that play a role in convalescent plasma? 
So I'm not a blood banker. So please take the answer with all the caveats that it requires. But there is a matching that happens, but it's not to the same extent as a red blood cell or a platelet transfusion would. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. So our next question um, from Victor. I think uh, some people probably do want to know what this is <laughs> and didn't ask. Um, what exactly is a randomized double blind clinical trial? So a double blind means both the patient and the physician and study personnel are blinded as to what product was given. So uh, the blood bank will pull whether it's convalescent plasma or control, but then they over label it so that you can't see what it is and send it to the bedside. And then it looks, it's still, both of them are plasma products. And so you can't distinguish the two. Um, and then that's done in a randomized fashion, like flipping a coin. Um, and uh, it's not alternating. It's just done in a random. So again, you could flip, you could flip heads three or four times in a row. Uh, but in the end, uh, we're going for an equal number of controls and an equal number of convalescent units, people that are treated. So that's the, the double blind component to the randomized trial. It's not strictly alternating control, convalescent, control, convalescent. Thank you. That's the, essentially the gold standard for clinical trials, as I understand it. And gives the best evidence in the quickest fashion, which of which we are in the most need at the present time. Marcia would like to know who can participate in the trials and how do you apply? Um, for people who have um, a, a diagnosis of SARS-CoV-2 with symptoms within six or seven days of onset, and you can go at the end of this, it's covidplasmatrial.com. We have a, a 800 number that will be uh, at the end. Um, and that's probably the best way to apply is either call the 800 number or uh, go to the website and then someone will reach back out with you uh, uh, on that. And I'll let Shmuel repeat his infection prevention qualifications. Sure. So for infection prevention, if somebody's been exposed, they have four days for us to reach them from the time of last exposure. So a uh, kid comes home and is infected. Everybody realizes the kid's infected and they ship off uh, mom and dad to somewhere else. The day that they were shipped off, that's the last contact. On the other hand, that probably only happens in fairy tales. In real life, everybody has to stay in the same home. So the uh, exposure is ongoing, and, uh, and and then we have a little bit more time to get the person, although we would like as soon as possible to have uh, a person after exposure so that we can uh, uh, try to prevent. So we go four days from last exposure, and then that gives us 24 hours to get our act together in terms of getting the blood type done, in terms of uh, getting all the, the, the testing done to make sure that the person does not have an infection. This is a prevention study, so we want to make sure that they don't have an infection. And then the next day or later that day, we'll transfuse them. And then I would think that a lot of people in those uh, would be essential workers or healthcare workers or other people that are coming into contact with um, a lot of people on a regular basis. That's correct. Now, one of the things with healthcare workers is, thankfully, in this country, uh, most healthcare workers have access to uh, personal protective equipment that uh, makes it so that when they do come in contact with somebody, it's not a high risk exposure. That doesn't mean that somebody who's working in a doctor's office and has taken off their mask for whatever, and then there was a patient there uh, that was coughing, that could be an exposure, or Another thing that can happen is a coworker can be in the break room and they, they both have their masks off and then they have the exposure there. So that's happened. Many of the people that we've enrolled into the study have been healthcare workers, but most of the exposures have actually happened outside of work. Interesting. Steven asks, uh, what will people participating in the trials be required to do? 
So for the post-exposure prophylaxis, what we require is for the person to uh, come in and uh, get uh, tested to make sure that they are negative and to get their blood type. And then we also get uh, some other uh, blood. Um, then the later that day or the next day, they get transfused. And then over the next 90 days, uh, we see them several times to measure their blood to check to see what the antibody level is doing so that uh, we can uh, answer uh, one of the, uh, I believe it was uh, uh, Sarah Lee's question as to how long uh, the uh, antibodies can stay in the body. And then we also check for the virus. Yes, we do that unpleasant nose thing to check to see if the virus is there and at what concentration and when it started and when it went away to get a sense as to how effective uh, the plasma is. And for the early treatment, we give you the transfusion and then see you back in 14 days. We'd rather you recuperate at home. Um, and some people have gotten better in three days. Some people take uh, a little bit longer. Um, and then we see you at a month's time and then at uh, 90 days. I'm gonna hit a couple of the questions on the sidebar if that's okay. Um, I, so I, I see one of the questions, uh, which is uh, from Claire, was how far along are we in the study and when do you expect to publish results? So uh, we are, uh, I'm going to say the, the fourth inning. So there's still, way, there's still room to go, but we're no longer uh, uh, starting out. So uh, we're hoping that uh, in, in the next uh, six to eight weeks, uh, if, uh, and it's, it's going to depend on, uh, on getting uh, uh, volunteers to participate in the study that will get up into the eighth or uh, ninth inning. So, uh, and then we'll uh, publish the results right away because we know that uh, everybody's really interested in finding out uh, about this. This is not a time to sit on data. Um, one of the other questions was um, uh, about uh, the uh, um, um, plasma um, reserves. Uh, oh, go, go, go ahead, reserves. Uh, the plasma reserves. And the plasma that we're using for this study mm -hmm. will not impact the availability of plasma for other purposes, whether it's for uh, uh, people that have immunological diseases or clotting diseases. It comes from a different supply. Uh, and uh, uh, there, we have plenty of plasma for this particular study. However, if uh, the study shows that uh, plasma is effective in preventing infection or in treating uh, infection in the outpatient area, there could be an increased demand for it. And uh, the, the country is preparing for that by uh, trying to stimulate uh, plasma collection. I will say that uh, uh, although there could be some hiccups and there could be some delays in supply here and there, the supply of plasma in the country continues to be very robust. There's plenty of it. And then because so many people have been infected, then uh, th there is a supply for people to, uh, to keep uh, uh, donating and to replenish it. Um, and there were some questions on the purity or how it's sourced. And I mean, it meets in some respects, it's even safer than a drug. Uh, it's a natural substance enhanced by antibodies. Um, and um, so it's something that's readily, uh, readily accepted, mostly locally sourced, uh, but can be that many New Yorkers have been generous and, um, uh, but also people in the South. So we can uh, move it from state to state within our studies, but most of it is um, locally sourced. Regarding question nine, what are the standards used to judge whether treatment is effective? So uh, the uh, post-exposure prophylaxis, the end point, what we're trying to see is can we prevent infection from happening? So somebody comes into the trial uh, not having any symptoms and having tested in their nose negative for virus, if they develop symptoms or if they develop symptoms and have a positive test, or if they develop symptoms, have a po if they don't develop symptoms and have a positive test, we're measuring all that. The thing we're really looking for is, did they go from not having an infection to having an infection. We're also gonna look at other things uh, uh, as to if they got sick, how sick they got, but we're gonna start at the very basic. Can we prevent infection from happening in the first place? So our next question from Scott, 
Are there any risks to people participating in the trials? How are you keeping the participants safe? Yes. Um, Go ahead, Shmuel. Yes, there are risks. There is nothing you can put in your body that is without risk, and plasma is something that you put in your body. We do know that plasma is extraordinarily safe because we give it all the time for a lot of indications in people that are pretty sick. That having been said, allergic reactions can happen. Uh, somebody uh, uh, can have a, uh, a, a blood transfusion reaction, and very, very rarely somebody can get the wrong unit for themselves and have a uh, problem with that. The reason I say very rarely is that there's multiple checks and balances in place to keep the blood supply as safe as possible and the recipients as safe. But I'm going to lie if I say, oh, this is 100% safe because it's just not. And we also segregate uh, people that are test negative and asymptomatic. They're still treated as a uh, potential infection, but we can handle them in the COVID negative space. For people that are COVID positive, um, we do work with them in a special negative pressure room or, or um, it's, it's a clinic room, um, or we have um, sort of a um, outpatient pod that is well heated, has uh, it's sort of a, a, a village where we can treat COVID positive people together uh, to minimize risk to healthcare workers. I've transfused 30 people over the past three months and um, uh, the nurses and myself have not acquired the infection. So we do look after patient safety, both with the transfusion itself, but also in the environment of uh, uh, COVID-19 to make certain that, that the patients and transportation and family members. And there are uh, cab companies that are able to transport people that are COVID positive. So they have special cabs and special drivers uh, that can pick people up. So if you're feeling not well enough, um, uh, you actually can call, we can arrange a cab it, it, um, and, and we've done that before. So that's another way that we can keep you safe uh, during the process of participating in the study trial. Thank you. I think one of the other questions that came up in the chat was whether there was any cost to the participants for um, being in the trial. No cost. Uh, we, um, we pay for the transfusion and for um, the laboratories associated with it. Uh, many places are giving you a pulse oximeter um, mm -hmm. and a thermometer, although the thermometer is not, not that much, so that you can monitor your uh, symptoms over time. And um, yeah, but there's, uh, there's no, and you, you actually, um, people pay you to participate. There is a couple hundred dollars, depending on site, uh, usually, um, uh, a couple uh, hundred dollars uh, to, per, to participate uh, for, the, for, for the trouble there. Picking up some of the other questions, has the EUA, that's the Emergency Youth Authorization from the FDA, uh, slowed down the study at all? And, and it, it, what I'll say is since that was put out by the FDA, actually our enrollment has increased. I, I can't tell if the two are related or not, but we've not seen that as a problem. Uh, another question was um, uh, that uh, it takes nine to 12 months to get immunoglobulin for infusion for primary immunodeficiencies. How did we get it so fast for this purpose? And, and the reason it's faster is that unlike immunoglobulin, which is a concentrated material that's made, uh, that, that starts out from human material, but then it's really made uh, in a uh, industrial setting. This is uh, collected by blood banks and uh, is, uh, is much earlier in the process. So it, it doesn't have uh, as much processing to do so we can get it down pretty quickly, which is one of the reasons why we uh, got interested in plasma so soon is that uh, we didn't want to wait nine to 12 months until we had something for uh, uh, coronavirus. We wanted to get right on it. Um, is it possible to uh, give antibody that could be injected by intramuscular injection? And uh, that actually goes back to the immunoglobulin question. I think that, uh, although I'm not in the immunoglobulin business, so I don't know for a fact, but I think that those type of concentrated uh, 
uh, products could potentially be miniaturized to the point where they're giving by subcutaneous or intramuscular injection. However, plasma, the advantage is it's ready, it's available, we have it now. The disadvantage is it is uh, about um, a cup of, uh, of material and, uh, and we've not been able to concentrate it down to the point where it's much lower than a, uh, a cup full of uh, plasma. So can't be given as a, as a shot, yet it needs to be given as an intravenous. So our next question submitted by Gordon, what are your biggest challenges in conducting these trials? Uh, I'll say that the, uh, the, the, the challenges in conducting the trials are as follows. One is that most people that have coronavirus don't go to places that have randomized controlled trials. They go to uh, uh, CVS or to uh, a local testing center and then they go home and they're not connected to a place that has a clinical trial. So the people that we uh, are encountering are the tip of the iceberg. That's one of the reasons why we're very excited to work with you so that the people that are part of your vast uh, network can learn about this and uh, see if this is right for them. The second problem is, or issue in terms of conducting these trials is that, that uh, we're trying to do everything really, really quickly. These are typically trials that take two, three years to go from uh, putting pen to paper until the first patient gets the, uh, uh, the treatment. We've done this in uh, six months. So uh, it's, um, uh, it, it, it's everything is compressed. Uh, next problem is most people that uh, have coronavirus uh, are not in groups that historically have been part of clinical trials. Uh, and uh, so sometimes there's a language barrier. Sometimes there is a cultural barriers. Uh, trust is, a, uh, is an issue that uh, uh, I, one of my favorite sayings is that progress happens at the speed of trust. And uh, uh, it, it's, um, uh, it's a leap of faith on the part of somebody to join a clinical trial. And if they or somebody in their family or their friend has never been in a clinical trial, then we're really asking them to trust us. So we're working as hard as we can to uh, gain people's trust. But if people don't trust us, I don't think I can take it personally because they don't know us. Well, I think we've covered off on the next couple of questions. I'd like to go to question 15 because I think it's a really interesting one. Great. So um, Carol asks, if, if you can prove that um, CP is effective at preventing spread of the disease and improving outcomes for people who are infected, how do you scale up to make this treatment available to the masses? If we show efficacy, then uh, society will respond. Right now, if we really show efficacy for outpatient and vaccines are not quite as effective, um, then in the end, this will, we will receive plasma in doctor's offices, we will receive it in urgent care centers, and we'll move away from getting plasma in a hospital setting. So that's the scale up is, uh, and we'd like to work on dose and to see if we can, if a smaller dose would be effective. Right now we're starting with uh, a middle to high dose and to make certain that we don't uh, underdose things, but uh, it will come out in our studies if a lower dose is uh, still fully protective or, uh, or connotes a full treatment. And um, so I guess that's how we envision the scale up. Um, I think people will donate and people have modeled the ability of infected people to donate. The other thing about donation is that one person can supply plasma units for up to 10 people um, mm -hmm. with three donations and each donation can treat three people. So you're easily at one infected person can treat. Uh, so in that, again, back to an egalitarian process, we think convalescent plasma is is cheap, ready available, can be scaled to developing countries in Africa, Southeast Asia, South America. Um, and uh, it's just requires a sterile process. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, I would uh, leave, it, leave it at that, thanks. Good question, Carol. 
Taking some of the questions from the side panel, uh, one of the questions was if we had patients with uh, CVID. Uh, so uh, we've had at least one, but we've also had uh, patients that are going for bone marrow transplants, patients that are going for, that have had liver transplants. So we've had patients that are highly, highly immunocompromised and we've not seen any difference between uh, other people uh, in those patients. Uh, uh, one of the other questions was, uh, is how are study results reviewed and analyzed to eliminate bias? Uh, it, it, I can say that, uh, that, that there's a, uh, an entire team of people that do not report to us that look at the study independently, um, a data safety monitoring board. There's also an independent monitor. And then there's also multiple monitors through our sponsor in the Department of Defense and through people at the National Institutes of Health that are constantly looking at this and uh, making sure that uh, everything is being done by the book. And uh, then afterwards, when we get all the information, uh, and uh, then we'll put it together. And uh, again, it will be reviewed, reviewed by another group of reviewers uh, prior to publication. So uh, uh, it's, it's, it's going to uh, be heavily uh, reviewed. Uh, is there something to eliminate bias? Uh, that's almost a philosophical question because there's always going to be some sort of bias. Uh, what uh, we're trying to do and the randomized control trial aspect of it uh, and the large number of patients is to make sure that there's as little bias as possible. I'd like to just to jump in on Toby's question about um, when the vaccine comes out, if I participate in the convalescent plasma trial can also get the vaccine. So the good thing about the convalescent plasma is uh, it really doesn't eliminate you from receiving other therapies. You can participate in a trial. And if you do go to the hospital, that's a primary endpoint. You can get convalescent plasma there. You can get other steroids, other drugs that are available there. Um, you, um, one, I think that the availability of a vaccine uh, probably will be after our 90 day window and receiving plasma, uh, the vaccine is gonna work just as well, whether you got plasma or not. And so people who even had um, the COVID plasma once, you still may be interested in getting a vaccination. Uh, so it would be, um, be in that same, um, be in that same category. So I think you can, you're open to get all the categories of the passive immediate immunities, convalescent plasma, hyperimmune globulin, or monoclonal antibodies. Uh, in a trial setting, getting one eliminates uh, your ability to get the others in a trial situation. But when they're all proven, you could, they're, they all can be mixed and matched and they're complementary. Um, they're just providing more antibodies in different ways. So, um, and often, um, uh, yeah, and you can mix them with the uh, vaccine too. Thanks. So a lot of people did ask about vaccines and when they might be available. Um, that seems to be the question of the hour. And um, we won't go through the next couple, but they're kind of related. So. Is does co if we can prove that uh, the convalescent plasma prevents infection, does that then become the vaccine or the passive vaccine as you were talking about earlier? It's still the immediate immunity, and we're still even if we have a vaccine, there's going to be immunosuppressed people or older people that don't respond as well. That mm -hmm. when they break through a vaccine, then immediate. Uh, provision of antibodies by the vehicle of convalescent plasma or monoclonal antibodies or hyperimmune globulin still will help them when given early. Um, and uh, the vaccine availability, I mean, I know that um, Moderna, which is the one in the lead right now, just uh, finished enrolling about 25,000 people out of 30,000 people uh, last week. So they have five more thousand to go. Uh, they've given 10,000 people two doses. So after the two doses, I guess the clock count starts counting. Mm -hmm. um, but right now in the United States, we're, um, um, if you just take the whole population, we're about at uh, one person out of 10,000 people uh, acquire 
a new infection each day. And so if you have 30,000 people, then that's three new infections in a population that size, but then it's, you know, um, uh, 90 people over a 30 day period. And that's, um, and over a two month period, that's like almost 200 people. And that's enough to show efficacy. And that's probably what they're aiming on. But then those answers are, you have to wait for people to encounter the virus naturally and see if they're protected. And mm -hmm. so that's why the uh, vaccine manufacturers are talking about a two month period where they're gonna watch and see. Um, so there's that simple, we may get some hints that it's working, but it's not gonna be the full measure uh, that's gonna be required for, for scaling it up. So in some respects, we already have a vaccine that's being tested. So it also, you have to be specific in your, um, so you could say we have many vaccines right now, but we're, we're really trying to see which ones are safe and have a measure of protection. And there, we'll probably end up with three or four vaccines with different measures of protection, anywhere from 50% to 70%. Um, and so that's, again, mirroring the uh, protection. In some respects, you can say we have a vaccine now, which we do, but whether it's gonna be available to a large number of people, I think Tony Fauci's right. That's gonna be in our new year. So we are um, running a little bit late today, but it's been a fantastic, fantastic session. Um, I do wanna ask one final question. And what is it that we can do to help make your trials successful? Continue to ask your questions and talk about it and continue to become virologists as y'all are doing for tuning into this. I think right now everyone in the world is a virologist. And so we just have to be flexibly, flexibly creative and uh, working on this together. It's easy for me to say as a doctor, but you know, all eyes on the virus. That's what we need to do to uh, get us uh, back to functioning together. Um, although we get back to, we have to walk and chew COVID gum, the saying, uh, I think, which we do have to do now. We have to uh, fight, um, um, but I think participating in these trials so that we can find quick answers. If you do are exposed or do come down, consider this as um, as uh, a very, we consider it uh, an attractive option. It's a 50% chance of getting therapy outside the hospital. We know it's safe. And uh, so that's how you can make it um, um, be a part of the solution with us, uh, which is what, we're, is what we're all trying to do. So, and thanks for tuning in for the past hour. So we'll just remind everyone that um, the trials that we've been talking about, you can find more information at covidplasmatrial.org. Um, there's a form you can fill out there and have someone contact you, or you can feel free to call the 800 number and uh, someone will walk you through some of the questions to determine your eligibility for the trials and to put you in touch with the trial coordinators. Um, we're proud that uh, that uh, that screening process and the calls are being handled by Medical Alert, and we're thrilled to be able to partner with uh, Johns Hopkins University in this very important thing. I think that all eyes on the virus is a really great way to say it. You know, we've uh, we've reached a place where, um, you know, I think we all have we all have some responsibility for uh, figuring out uh, the way forward. So, everything that you can do to either uh, participate in the trial or identify someone else who has the opportunity to participate in the trial. We just really encourage you to, uh, to make the call or check out the information online and uh, share that information with other people. Um, Johns Hopkins University, as many of you know, is really the leading resource on coronavirus information. Their mapping and testing statistics are uh, incomparable and have been a continuous source of truth through uh, this whole entire experience. So 
we encourage you to continue to uh, make use of those resources. And um, for Medical Alert, we've made available a lot of great information from sources like Johns Hopkins that we vetted to ensure that people who have specific chronic medical conditions have a place to go to talk about what does COVID mean for me. So um, please do check out our COVID-19 Resource Center. Um, and on the next slide, if you enjoyed this today, we have um, a library of different topics that we've talked about over the last few months uh, since COVID has come into play uh, about diabetes, about heart disease, about uh, just regular chronic disease. What does it mean for people with dementia, for uh, autism? So um, please make use of those resources. That's what they're there for. And uh, we'll do a quick survey. Melody? Yes. So I've launched that survey if you, you know, uh, mind taking a moment and letting us know, um, giving us your feedback on our session today. We definitely appreciate that feedback. And I just want to say thank you again to Dr. Shoham and Dr. Sullivan. Um, we know that you are seeing patients and conducting multiple trials and super busy, but this is really important stuff and we're so grateful for you to share this information and to, to help uh, train some new virologists. Thank you for having us. And I just found out that I'm not allowed to vote. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's how we take bias out of the process. <laughs> All right, take care. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. All right, bye. thank you. Bye.